Everybody, if you'll flip over to Psalm 12 for me. Psalm 12. So in 2019, our family, the Perkinses, had the opportunity to go to Bucaramanga, Colombia, and serve alongside some of the missionaries that we support here at the church, Michael and Daisy Lynch. Uh, they were here over this past summer. A lot of you got the chance to meet them. It was pretty cool uh, that they were here and hadn't seen them in a couple of years. Um, and it was pretty fun. On the kind of the journey leading, so that was the first kind of international mission trip that our family went on. Our kids were young, like really young. Um, you know, they had to, we partnered with another church that also supports Michael and Daisy, and they had to keep lowering down the age range so Denny could go with us. Uh, it was like 12, and then it was 10. I was like, no, you need to lower it down more. He was eight turning nine. Kaylee was 10 years old. Jade's grandmother is a worry wart. She doesn't like us going downtown Richmond to go to dinner. And so when we told them that, uh, you know, her grand, great grandmother, uh, theirs and her grand, that we were taking the kids to South America, um, you know, needless to say, she, she had her, her own sense of fear that we were going to be okay, that our little blonde hair, blue eyed kids were going to be kidnapped, never to be seen again. But th through the Lord's grace, uh, we were protected the whole time. And so we did many things that week. Um, you know, we, we went into the Raposo, which is like the ghetto, is what they would call it. Uh, we went and to a school there, like an elementary school, and did like a VBS type thing. It was really cool, working alongside the, uh, the children there. Uh, when you're in town, they know where the Americans are at, at all times. Um, at least they did where, when we were there. People were coming by, they were staring. It was about 15 of us. When you get off the plane, it's not TSA to meet you. It's like military guys with machine guns. Um, why are you here? We're here to visit friends. It's a big group of people visiting friends. But we also went to a nursing home. And I'll tell you, if, if I ever needed to go to a nursing home, I, I want to go in Columbia. Um, the, the way that they loved each other, the way that the staff loved the people that they were caring for, it, it was really special to see. But kind of the one thing that stood out more than anything that week. At the time, there was unrest in Venezuela. Um, refugees were fleeing Venezuela. It was just a bad place to be. In Colombia, I mean, Colombia is no first world country, um, but you know, hopefully they would have more opportunity fleeing Venezuela going into Colombia. And by the time they met us, we had a tent set up on the side of the road. Um, they were probably two weeks into their journey by foot. They've left everything that they've ever known, their house, their family. It was some families walking together with small children. It was some single ladies in their 20s. It was old people. It was young people. They were just trying to flee Venezuela. A lot were trying to go to Bogota. So Bogota being the biggest city in Colombia, about 7 million people. Uh, Bucaramanga was like 600,000. So they were just kind of like on a journey. Um, we had food for them. Um, we had a foot washing station because some didn't have shoes. And so they've left everything that they've ever known, and here they are on this journey. And so for me, knowing in a couple of days I was going to be back home, I could go to Food Lion in Ashland when I wanted more food. Uh, I had all my family close to me. I have you guys close to me. And they're going where they don't know if they're going to have a job, where they don't know if they're ever going to see anybody again. Maybe in that moment I've never felt more alone in my entire life than I did uh, hanging outside on the side of the road with those folks. And so the question is, have you ever felt really alone? David, when he wrote Psalm 12, he felt alone. He looked around and all he saw was enemies. And Psalm 11, as Bill told us last week, the wicked were destroying the foundations of society. Now it seems like they've succeeded in wiping out the godly with their lies and their deception and so David may have written this psalm as Saul was trying to kill him. You know, because Saul lied about David to manipulate his leaders. In return, people lied to Saul. We read in 1 Samuel uh, uh, chapter 24, it said, And David said to Saul, Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks you harm? He may have also written this during his son Absalom's rebellion. And so his very own son was rebelling, trying to overthrow his kingdom and take over. Absalom seduced Israel with his lies, and his military coup was marked by espionage, by betrayal, by misdirection, by intrigue. 
it doesn't matter when it was written. Whenever it was written, we know that David felt utterly, utterly alone. Our Lord Jesus was even more alone as he walked through this world. He was the only son of God. He is the only man in history who always spoke the truth. He never told a lie. In the end, even his closest friends, though, abandoned him as he walked to the cross alone. And so David's sense of isolation in Psalm 12 points forward to Christ, the son of David. David, we read, entrusted this psalm to the choir master so all the future generations would hear the words. They would hear them sung in the temple. They would hopefully take them to heart. They would learn to love the truth. Unfortunately, as we know, they didn't listen because years later, the prophets Hosea, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Micah, they all condemned Israel for the same wicked culture of lies. And so if this is the, how things are among God's people, what must the Gentile world have been like? And so David extrapolates from what is happening in Israel to conclude that all humanity is depraved. We're all sinners. We're all of sin. And so the psalm begins and ends globally with David's comment on all human beings. Verse 1 says that the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Verse 8 tells us that vileness is exalted among the children of man. And so when God's people are corrupt, what must the rest of the world be like? People who have never known God or heard his word. And so, brothers, sisters, this is the world in which we live today. Psalm 2 tells us that the world is set against Jesus Christ, God's king. And so if you're a Christian, what should you do when you feel alone? in a society that is so soaked with lies. I think what we're gonna to read today, and David's response in Psalm 12 is gonna be our example. In the first four verses, David prays for help as the wickedness prevails. In the last four verses, David trusts God's promise to protect his people. So if you're able and willing, please stand with me as we read God's word. <clears throat> to the choir master, according to the Sheminith, a psalm of David. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast to those who say, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side, the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Father, thank you so much for your word, Lord. Thank you for the comfort that your word brings, the truth that your word brings. Lord, just as we get to open it this morning, as we get to study it, Lord, let our hearts be open to realize all the truth that all your word contains in all places. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. And so as the psalm opens... David obviously has nowhere to, but to look up to God. He could have retreated, but instead he lifts his prayer up to the God of heaven. And so there are many Christians today who spend more time complaining about the sinfulness of the world than they do in prayer, right? Some Christians spend more time getting stirred up by talk radio and TV than they spend time talking with God. And so David starts with the right instincts. He looks up to God and calls out to him for help. The first words of this short prayer shoot up like an arrow. He says, save, O Lord, can also be translated help, O Lord. And then he fills out the prayer with help uh, with an explanation. He says in verse 1, he says, save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone, for the faithful have vanished among the children of man. And so when we think of faithfulness, we tend to think of maintaining sound doctrine, Remaining faithful to the truth, and certainly that's important. The scriptures tell us in Jude 3 to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, right? 
But the faithful, quote unquote, in this context refers to faithful living that pleases God. All right, that's what we're talking about here. Faithful ones steadfastly keep their commitments. They honor their covenant with God by trusting him and serving him from the heart. We were talking about that this morning in our Sunday school class inside James. They, they were doers, right? They were very faithful in their actions. They honor their relationships with others through their loyalty, through their trustworthiness, through their integrity, through their dependability. And so David looked around and what he saw, he said, I see people that are saying all the right things with their lips, but he didn't see many people whose lives match their words. Isn't that the same for us today? You can be very orthodox in your theology while your life is far from God. You can be very legalistic and miss Jesus along the way. And so David saw men who offered sacrifices and observed all the religious festivals, but their lives actually denied what their lips said. And so he concludes in the verse, he said, the faithful have vanished among the children of man. And so David zeroes in on the wicked speech as the essence of their evil. He says in verse two, he said, everyone utters lies to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. And so guys lying, fake compliments, proud boasting destroyed the faithful living. And so when he says everyone in there, that emphasizes the breadth of the problem. And when he says to his neighbor, to your neighbor, that emphasizes the depth of the problem. Young and old, rich and poor, male and female, every segment of Israel's society was deceitful. The fabric of society was torn since neighbor was lying to neighbor. And so as the church, nothing will destroy our relationships more quickly than lies. Guys, we are never, ever, ever to lie about anything, ever. We tell that to our kids. We need to live the exact same way. When Christians are dishonest with each other, they tear apart the body of Christ. Deceit breeds distrust. Distrust leads to division. That's why the scriptures clearly say in Ephesians 4, it says, therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so if we want to live together in love and in unity, we must be people of truth. Now, Bill told us last week, and I 100% agree, it, it's not so much what you say, it's, it's how you say it. That's a Bill Carter quote from last week, probably comes from his mama, and, and I 100% agree with it, right? Jesus spoke truth at all times, but he spoke a different truth to, to the wicked Pharisees then he would speak to his brother in Christ, okay? Context matters, context matters. But what our lips say comes from who we are inside. Jesus said in Matthew 12, he says, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so when we think of the heart as a seed of emotions and affections, you know, when we're kids, we cut out little hearts for Valentine's Day. But the Hebrew way of thinking, the heart was a seat of thought, your true self, who you really are. In fact, the scriptures usually point to the heart closer to what we think of as intellect or the mind. The double-hearted man is thinking two things at the same time, what he wants and what he needs to say to get what he wants, right? We know people like that. Truth takes a back seat to selfishness. The Apostle James gives us a classic description of the power of the human tongue. It says in James 3, So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. I mean, no wonder David 
calls on God to take such drastic measures. He asks God in verse 3 and 4 to do away with these liars. He says, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, With our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? So what does David mean by cutting off the lips and slicing out the tongue? Because to me, it sounds kind of nasty, a little bit grotesque. But the parallelism between verses 3 and 4 suggests it's a figure of speech called sendeki, where parts of the body refer to the whole person. For instance, when a ship's captain says, all hands on deck, he wants more than just thumbs and fingers, right? <laughs> He, he wants the, the sailors on deck. He wants the whole person, their whole bodies on deck. And so in the same way here, when David's writing the lips and tongue in verse 3 refers to the flatterers and the boasters, David is asking here for God to cut off their lives is what he's asking God to do. And it may seem like a harsh prayer until you stop and think about the destruction that liars and deceivers do with their tongues. Liars and boasters do much damage by perverting the gospel, the truth of God's word, who he really is, and those who listen to them will lose more than their lives. They're going to lose their souls for eternity. And so when Jude warns us that false teachers will creep into the church, he describes them with almost the very same words here in Psalm 12. He says in Jude verse 16, he said, these are grumblers malcontinence, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth, boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. And so these teachers not only condemn themselves, they drag others into the fires of hell along with them. Yeah, I wasn't born yet, but I read a little bit of history. November 18th, 1978, Jim Jones led 914 members of his cult to commit mass suicide in Guyana. He boasted to them that God had anointed him. He flattered the people. He betrayed them, body and soul. And so most false teachers do not take their followers' lives physically like this, but their false gospel surely leads them to eternal punishment in hell. And so when we consider the damage that deceivers can do with their tongue, David's harsh words make a whole lot more sense. The stakes are so high that the fun punishment has to fit the crime. Right? We can't just apply this to others, though, without looking at ourselves, without me looking at myself. You know, Our own lips sometimes are deceitful, unfortunately. It's horrible. I hate it. According to James, your tongue and mine are a restless evil that makes great boasts that we read. And so when David says in verse 3, May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boast, he's talking about you. He's talking about me. We deserve to be judged for our words. If we're honest, right, we know that we've hurt and we've deceived other people at times with our tongues. And so where does that leave us? There's only been one man who's never flattered. One man who's never boasted. One man who's never deceived in the slightest, and the Bible said that is Jesus Christ. First Peter chapter 2 tells us that he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Jesus Christ is the one man who never sinned with his words. And the good news of the gospel is that although you and I should be condemned for our words, our sins can be forgiven. They're wiped away. We can be credited with his sinfulness, his sinless mouth, his spotless obedience. That's why the Bible also says in 1 Peter 2, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And so when we come to Jesus, he turns us into faithful people who speak the truth from the heart. John 14, 17 tells us the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us is called the Spirit of Truth. 2 John 2 tells us God's truth now lives inside of us. That's why we're a, t a temple. Our body's a temple. We have the Holy Spirit inside of us at all times, in all places, in all ways that is guiding our life on a day-to-day -day basis. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's not enough to be like Jiminy Cricket and try to never tell a lie. Our tongue is a restless evil. Because even if we never utter another deceitful word, we're guilty for the things we've already said. 
We need our guilt to be taken away. We need a new power inside of us that is strong enough to control our tongue. We need to be forgiven through Jesus' death and resurrection. We need the power of God's Spirit inside of us. We need to be saved. The people who trust their ability to speak think they're never going to be held accountable. We know those people. Unfortunately, we've run into them at times in our life. They say things like, who is master over us? And they might not use those exact words, but that's what they're getting at. I control my destiny. I'm the master of my own life. It's like, what are you talking about, first of all? But for us, we know the answer is easy. God is our master. God will judge. And now, as we come into the second half of this psalm, it's time for God to speak. In the second half of Psalm 12, God's word confronts the words of the wicked. Man's words at times might seem powerful, but they're weak. Sometimes we read God's words and they come across as weak, but they're living and they're powerful. And so this is the first psalm that contains a direct answer from the psalmist's prayer. Very first one. It's only the second psalm to quote God's direct words. The last was Psalm 2, verse 6. A direct answer to prayer stands out because it's rare in the Psalms that God actually speaks and we read it. And so, verse 5, it says, Because the poor are plundered, because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him in the safety for which he longs. And so the weak and the helpless are the first victims in a deceitful society because they're powerless. The poor are, are needy, they're vulnerable. Sometimes the needy are actively plundered. Scammers take advantage of them with cheap products, cheap furniture that falls apart, used cars that they buy that may have been written off in a flood, food that has almost no nutritional value. And since they don't have a financial cushion, it's easier to rip them off with credit card scams and payday loans. Brewers and distillers often target low-income communities with their billboards. They promise a man that he'll have a good time and he'll be popular if he drinks their brand of beer. Not in all cases, but unfortunately all too often, in return for his money, they give his family a drunken man for a husband and a father. But God sees when the poor are plundered. He also hears when the needy moan and groan from neglect. In a deceitful society, neighbors do not trust each other or care for one another as they should. No one bothers to lift the load from a widow's shoulders. No one stands up for the immigrant who's paid less than he's worth. No one thinks to feed children who are hungry over the weekend. But God hears a moan when no one else cares. In the context of these psalms, the godly are by and large the poor and oppressed. The wicked shoot at them from the shadows. We read last week, Psalm 11, 2, For behold, the wicked bend the bow. They have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. And they've been so successful that the godly seem to have disappeared from the land. David numbers himself among the poor and needy by using the pronoun us in verse 7. This is King David that numbered himself among the poor and the needy says, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. So while David speaks of the poor in general, he's particularly thinking about God's people who are often trampled and abused in this world. But God sees and hears the cries of his people, and God takes action. Like a warrior standing up to do battle, in verse 5, God says, I will now arise. He's a champion for his people. God is at work every day in our lives through divine providence, brothers, sisters. But the work now, or the word now, implies a specific moment in time when God takes action. This decisive moment came when God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. When Christ began his earthly ministry, Jesus himself defined his ministry as announcing good news to the poor as he taught in the synagogue. Luke 4, verses 17. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, 
to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And so throughout history, the gospel has gone forward among the poor and needy of society. It was true of the churches in the first century, as the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standard, standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring nothing, things that are. So no human being may boast in the presence of God. And so even today, the church is growing most quickly uh, in the majority of the world in the southern and eastern hemispheres, not the affluent west, not Europe and America where a lot of the money is, right? God took action decisively through Jesus Christ, and more often than not, uh, it has been the poor who have responded to his call. But he places everyone who calls on him in the safety for which they long. The walls of his kingdom surround us. They protect us more securely than a shield or armor or a missile defense system. So what this doesn't mean is that we'll never lose our job because a coworker lies about us. Doesn't mean we'll never be tricked or deceived out of our savings. What it does mean is that God will only allow things in our life that will be for our good and more importantly for his glory. Amen. Always. Romans 8.28 tells us, it says, And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And so even if the worst happens... We know that God is in control and even using this hardship to bless you. In fact, as painful as it is, this hardship might be the best thing that could have happened for you. This is the ultimate security anyone could hope for, to know without a doubt that God is for us. But all this was still far off for David as he wrote Psalm 12. Christ would not come for another thousand years. And we might wait years and decades before God steps in, we might go to our grave, still waiting for God to make things right. And so the question is, can we trust God to keep his promise? And the answer is yes, always, forever, because God doesn't lie. And so David responds to God's word with a beautiful expression of faith in verse 6. The Lord has spoken, David's prayed, then he responds, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. And so every word of God is precious and pure. It's the picture of a silversmith refining precious metal to remove the impurities. David compares God's word to silver refined in a crucible seven times. Not the slightest impurity remains. The silver is ultra pure. The silver is ultra precious. It's a picture of the priceless perfection of God's word. And so today, we generally use the word inerrancy to describe the purity and truthfulness of God's word. And as the word suggests, inerrancy means that the scriptures are without error in all that they affirm. Beginning in Genesis, ending in Revelation, all truth, all without error, not one blemish, not one mistake, 100% true. And so because of that... God inspired the scriptures by his Holy Spirit, and the scriptures are true and without error. Whenever they speak about history, or geography, or science, or archaeology, as well as all spiritual truths and matters of salvation, it's always true. Always. And so when David hears God's answer to his prayer, he marveled at the brilliant perfection and purity of God's word. His faith continued as he stood on God's promise to protect him in his life. It says, you, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever. On every side the wicked prowl, as vileness is exalted among the children of man. Friends, nothing in David's life has, has it's changed. The wicked are still prowling as they were in the beginning of the psalm. If anything, maybe the situation is worse than it was when he began. 
Not only are the godly still a remnant, but depravity is exalted among all peoples. But David has changed. He's not crying out to God for help anymore. He's heard God's word. He believes God's word. And so whatever man may do, God surrounds him with the presence as with a shield. This was David's confidence. It's the confidence of our Lord Jesus Christ as well as he walked alone in the world of lies and deceit. And it needs to be our confidence too. And so that's the question is, does God know you? Do you know God? Do you trust his word? We can give lip service all day long. The Lord knows our hearts. But the question is, as we walk through the world, do we really believe what we say we believe? Do our actions show it? Because if we do, we'll be able to smile with a quiet Christian confidence at the world around us. We may feel alone at times, but we'll know that God has placed us in the safety for which we long. God has surrounded us with the walls of his kingdom forever and ever and ever, always and for eternity. Father, thank you, Lord, for this time this morning, God. Just, Lord, the opportunity to open your word, to read your truth, to be reminded of the love that you have for each and every one of us, Lord. A love so great that you're always with us at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. Father, let us just look to you to give us that quiet confidence that we should have to know that we are a child of yours. Father, thank you for Jesus sending your son that we get to be with you forever and ever and ever. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.